here with us. My name is John Wagler, and I'm part of this Hill City team here, and just so thankful that you chose to be here on this Sunday, uh, and uh, just so thankful um, that, because you could be a lot of other places, and uh, the fact that you're here uh, means a lot. And we are starting the Stronger series, uh, which is four weeks. We're going to spend four weeks talking about relationships, and uh, that we want healthy relationships, right? No one, how many of you guys have been in a bad relationship before? Yeah, no one was like, you know what, I feel so alive in this. And, uh, and so what we want to do is over the next four weeks, we want to talk about what does it mean to cultivate healthy relationships? What does it mean uh, to really look at some of the details of how we interact with people and uh, see what God is actually uh, has for us? You know, when you think about relationships, the reality is, is that we were designed to be in them. And here's why we know this, uh, because loneliness is a thing, right? No one, no one says this. No one's like, I love being lonely. It's so fruitful. I feel so close to God when I'm lonely. I feel like this is who I was designed to be, is to be lonely. Uh, if loneliness wasn't uh, a problem, uh, there wouldn't be so many health issues associated with it, satisfaction levels of life, all those things. And so the fact that loneliness is a problem shows that we are meant to be in healthy relationships with people. We were designed for that. We were created for it. Uh, you'll hear this line uh, every week in this series that uh, our satisfaction level in life rises or will rise or fall uh, on the health of our relationships. So however healthy our relationships are determines uh, how satisfied we are in life. And so uh, we're going to look at that uh, every single week. And we're going to look at, like, this is who you're designed to be, to be in healthy, strong relationships. But it takes work. It takes work to get there. Uh, you know, I was, I've just finished this book called uh, The Righteous Mind. And it's not a Christian book, but it's this guy who takes a look at... Uh, how groups, how, why people think the way that they think. And there's some neurological and biological stuff in there that I really like. And then there's just some kind of general things in there too. And he dives into this fact that, uh, the fact that we are designed to be like in groups of people. And one of the things he talks about that, you know, in primitive societies, like everyone danced together all the time. And that there was this collective joy that happened uh, in the midst of it. And because oxytocin is produced and mirroring neurons happen. And that, um, that's what we were designed to do. Was to be able in, like, in groups to, to like dance together. To do things together like that. We were at a wedding last night and people were, were just dancing together. And no one was like mad. Like no one's like dancing mad. I mean maybe like, uh, like, 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 but like but not like mad doing it. You know like. They're not like, man, this, I'm really mad that I'm dancing right now. And so there's this collective joy that ends up happening in the, in the midst of it that you were designed to be. Uh, to Robbie's point, it's like when you go to a college game, any college, um, every college has their thing, right? Like Virginia Tech has the inner Sandman part. Um, UVA, UVA football, um, I don't know if they do this in basketball or not, but like in UVA football, they do the, when they score a touchdown, uh, those three times a year, they go like, go like this, like, and they, they get arms together, and, um, and they have their thing, like VCU has their, like, you don't want to go to war with the Rams, like, don't start in our stuff, won't be no stuff, like, all that stuff, and so, like, everything has it, but there's this collective thing that happens in the midst of it that produces this joy, this connection, and that when we aren't in relationship with people, we, we miss out on it. Like, we were designed for it. Uh, even this week, what, uh, Avengers, like, Endgame came out, and, um, and some of y'all, like, as grown adults, like, dressed up. Like, and that was, like, but it's fine. Like, you know, like, it's cool. Like, it's in those moments, like, you're, you're doing something together, and it's meaningful. Like, you were designed for that. Like, it's a big deal. And so uh, that's what we're going to talk about, this idea of healthy relationships, because um, what's at stake when we, when we don't have healthy relationships or when our relationships are unhealthy? Our joy. Our joy. So when we don't invest in our relationships, then we have to realize that we are stripping ourselves of joy. So you might as well, if you're like, I'm not willing to invest in and learn in and grow in and, and change all this thing. If, you, if, you're, if that's you, that's the state of mind that you're in, you can tell your future self, hey, I don't care about your joy. And so uh, we want to take some time to invest in that because Jesus set this unbelievable tone about relationships. Uh, in John 13, he, he said this, he said, and since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. 
I have given you an example to follow. Do as I, I, do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know the, these things, God will bless you for doing them. So Jesus says, listen, you, you've got to learn to sacrifice. You've got to learn to submit to one another, love one another, be generous to one another and be kind and empathetic to one another. And then as you do this, I'm not asking you to do this, I'm telling you to do this. You, you, you do this just as I have done it. He isn't like, hey, when it's convenient for you, love one another, wash each other's feet. He goes, this is what you do. This is how you act. This is how you love one another. And when you do that, you are in line with what I've taught. So he's saying that, and that's when he says, when he, like, this is like you'll experience the blessings of God in that. He's like, you are in line and you're connected with me. So when we don't love like that, when we don't treat each other like that, we are out of step with Jesus. And that's the heart that he's, that he's saying. And then he says later on in that chapter, in verse 35, he says this. He says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And so Jesus, like, again, puts this kind of heavy, uh, the heaviness to relationships and saying, if you don't love one another and if you don't submit to one another, if you don't sacrifice one another, you're not generous to one another, if you don't love like I'm teaching you to love each other, then guess what? I would question whether or not you actually love me. And so when it comes to relationships, Jesus is saying it's not only pivotal, it actually proves whether or not our faith is real. Why? Because you, when we love Jesus more and follow Jesus, we inherently have to love people more. I say that in every wedding I ever do, that the best relationships are the ones that as you love God more, you love people more because you cannot love God more and not love people more. It's impossible. If you say you're loving God more and you're not loving the people around you more, then you don't actually love God more. And so it's impossible. And so Jesus sets this incredible tone for us to follow. Why? Because you were created to be in healthy relationships and healthy friendships and healthy marriages and healthy dating and healthy work relationships. You were created to be in healthy relationships. We're going to take a look at a, a passage in 1 Samuel 18 today, and we're going to see, uh, here's what's going to happen. You're going to see three people in this passage. You're going to see Saul, who's the first king of Israel. Uh, he was a guy who was kind of set apart from the rest and uh, at one point was in line with God and then got away from him. And then his son, Jonathan, who's heir to the throne, who's supposed to be the next king. And then this guy named David, uh, who maybe you've heard of before. If you're not familiar with the Bible, maybe you've heard the story of David and Goliath. Um, it's that David. And David uh, is, uh, he's supposed to be king. And so you could see where maybe him and Jonathan would have a difference of opinion on what's coming next. And, and so, but what we're going to see here in this passage, I want you to see how, how Saul kills all his relationships and how Jonathan and David actually cultivate healthy ones. And that's going to be what the main question for us today is simply that, are you killing or cultivating healthy relationships? And so we're going to look at some keys of, of what that looks like. So 1 Samuel 18 says this, after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to, uh, to David, together with his tunic, his sword, his bow, his bow, and his belt. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it su successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men, uh, of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul, and they sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. He says, what's this? They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day. But Saul had a spear in his hand, and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. Saul was then afraid of David, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. Finally, Saul sent him away in his appointment his, uh, and appointed him commander over a thousand men, and David faithfully led his troops into battle. David continued to succeed in everything he did, for the Lord was with him. When Saul recognized this, he became even more afraid of him. 
But all of Israel and Judah loved David because he was so successful at leading his troops into battle. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a first, take a look at what are some keys to killing your relationships, and then we'll look at keys to cultivating healthy ones. And so here's the first one to, to kill your relationship would be to stuff your issues, to stuff away your issues. Um, every single person brings some relational baggage into, into their relationships. Everybody. Like, no one is coming into a friendship, uh, dating somebody, or getting married. No one's coming into this just free. We all have some kind of baggage. And uh, the, the problem is, is we don't wrestle with that. So Saul, he had some baggage. He had some baggage from his past. Um, and even before this, with, with uh, even becoming king and some things that were happening in his life back then that he never dealt with. And then he, we see that he's jealous of David and he's kind of dealing with some power issues. He's got some things going on there. And so he's, he's got all these other issues. And what does he do? He stuffs them away. And as he stuffs away the issues, it ruins his relationships. It eventually ruins his relationships with David, who was a trusted confidant. It ruins relationships with his family. It ends up ruining relationships with other commanders in his army. And he, why? Because he stuffed away his issues all the time. And for a lot of us, that's what we do. We continuously just stuff things away. How many of you guys have that closet in your house? It might be the attic or the basement or that random room that you just don't open the door, right? And you somehow like slipped enough things in there that like you can't even open it anymore. And there's, what is that? It's just like stuffing away, stuffing away, stuffing away, stuffing away till some point you're like, I got to clean this up. Think about it. If you were to sell your house with all the stuff in there, would people be like, yes, look at all this garbage everyone left us. But that's what we do in relationships. We stuff it away. We've got all this baggage, and we expect when we get in relationships, like, yes, I love all this stuff. I'm so thankful you've never dealt with it. And so, so here's what ends up happening. At the core of great relationships, it requires vulnerability and transparency. And so if we don't do that... If we don't do that, here's what else happens. Wherever there should be trust, there's now suspicion in every relationship. You don't have other options. You know this. In, in every friend you have, every, <clears throat> anybody you've ever dated or if you're married or whatever, like in every relationship, it's trust or suspicion. There's no other option. You either trust someone or you're suspicious of it. And so when we aren't vulnerable, when we aren't transparent, when we aren't sharing and dealing with what we maybe were raised with or whatever, <clears throat> excuse me, we will, uh, that lack of transparency and vulnerability all of a sudden makes us a, a, a suspicious person relationally. So let me give you an example. Uh, every single human on the face of this planet, when they were born, immediately they had a, uh, what's called attachment. So from the second that you're born... Uh, some people might even believe it actually happens in the womb, but <clears throat> we have uh, an attachment. And there are four kind of major divisions of attachment. Uh, the first one is this. The first one is avoidance. So this is like if your primary caregivers when you were growing up, if they were unavailable. So when I say unavailable, it could have been because of divorce, <clears throat> because it, maybe there was a health issue that ended up happening or some sort of, some sort of crisis, which made your, your primary caregiver un, unavailable. Um, if that was your story or part of your story, then what ends up happening is that emotionally, as you get, become an adult, you become distant in your own relationships. You, you, your, your emotional intelligence is a little bit lower. Uh, you don't know how to emotionally engage with people, and you become distant in your own relationships if you don't deal with what happened in your, in, as, a, as a young child. <clears throat> Man, I can't get this on my throat. Um, the second thing is... Uh, uh, you have avoidance. Thank you, Lauren. Um, <clears throat> aha, here we go. You have, uh, thank you. Um, you have something called avoidance. All right, so avoidance is when uh, your primary caregiver was unreliable. Uh, they were technically around, but un unreliable. They were unreliable emotionally. Uh, they were unreliable even physically. Uh, they were just unreliable. And here's what happens if, you're, if you grew up with a primary caregiver like that, you would be, um, you can't, you can trust others, but you can't trust yourself. You can trust others, but you can't trust yourself. And here's what else happens with folks that grew up with someone who's unreliable. Uh, you will become typically clingy, uh, needy, uh, and dependent, and you're always seeking approval from others. 
So if you haven't dealt with that, when you think about your primary caregiver growing up, if that was part of your story and you haven't dealt with that part, like it reveals itself as an adult. A third one is, uh, it's called scattered. Scattered, which means that um, your primary caregiver was both uh, unreliable and unavailable. And so when, when that happens, this weird thing uh, begin, you begin to experience in your own relationships as an adult, you, you want and you know you need emotional attachment and connection. And so you'll bring people close, but the second they get too close, you immediately push them back away. And it comes this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And, and the fourth one is there is like a healthy option. There's a stable option. All right, so that is like an option, uh, and that stable option is certainly there where you have the ability to have, uh, you're emotionally aware, and you grew up in uh, of a very reliable and present home life, and you're, you're both your parents, your father and mother were there together, like, and you experience the health of that that enables you to have healthy relationships. Uh, you have a better chance of having healthy relationships as an adult. And here's the thing, until you deal with what happened in your past, as a child and like really deal with it and talk about it and be vulnerable about it and transparent about it and learn to and learn to like discuss it with other folks and everything you will have unhealthy relationships as an adult guaranteed and and i really mean that guaranteed you won't be able to date well you won't marry well you won't friend well and and so until you do that um, you'll be in a consistent cycle of unhealthy relationships and requires vulnerability and trust. So if you want to keep stuffing away, just know you're doing that at your own peril and you're stripping yourself of joy, just like Saul did. And so we, we've got to see, okay, then what is, this is why like parenting's a big deal, right? When someone's like, ah, oh, I can't wait to have kids. I'm like, you're going to mess them up some way. Like we all do, right? Like every parent ever has messed their kid up in some way. And so, but then you got to like deal with that to get healthier and learn and, and grow. But that's part of it. The second thing, uh, you let envy lead the way. If you want to kill your relationships, you let envy and jealousy lead the way. We see this with Saul. He, he hears what the women are saying uh, about David. And the first thing is like, man, he gets so jealous. And it talks about this tormenting spirit. Um, and, and people don't know if it was an actual spirit or if it was a way to describe that his jealousy was so bad and his envy was so bad, he just got angry. And, and like the, the kind of anger, like scary anger, which I know some of you guys in this room have been around before. Some of you guys in this room have been that person who's been that angry. And it's the kind of anger that scares people, the kind of anger that doesn't know how to monitor your voice, the kind of anger that just snaps, the kind of anger that uh, um, is like, all, like so defensive whenever anyone challenges, the kind of anger that it's all petty arguments all the time. Like a petty argument is like a good day. It's like that kind of anger. And that, that's what happened with Saul because what? He, he let envy and jealousy uh, control him. He let envy and jealousy lead his emotion. I wrote this down this week. I said, envy robs our joy because of comparison to others and what we don't have and then causes resentment because we don't enjoy what we do have. Saul is the king. He's the king. He has everything. And, and what does Saul do? He's got all this resentment uh, towards David. He can't even enjoy what he, what he does have. He's got all this jealousy uh, towards David because he sees what David is getting. And so we, you gotta, then we, for us, we got to start thinking, like, is that what's shaping us? Do I look at other people? If I'm single in this room, do I look at other people who are dating or married? And am I jealous? Am I envious? And is that controlling my mind? If, if I'm married, am I looking at other couples and, and be like, oh, I wish I had that, or I wish they were like that, or I wish, or if maybe if you don't have kids yet, and it's the same thing, is it jealousy, is it envy, is it leading us into this comparison game, and comparison eventually kills. We don't appreciate what we do have. We can't enjoy what we, we do have. And again, we continuously strip ourselves of joy. The third thing that will do to kill relationships, you'll separate yourself from good influences. You separate yourself from good influences. Um, that David playing the harp is supposed to be a sweet thing. So David sits down and he's like, dee, 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 whatever. whatever. And, and, like, and, he, and he, he does this in the harp, and, and what, is, what Saul's response is to pick up a spear and chuck it at him. That even in the, the good that was around him, 
even in the things that were pure, even in the things that should have been like, this, had this like good effect on him, what did Saul want to do? He wanted to separate himself from anything that was good. And so for you, it might be uh, anytime you're around people that uh, could be a good influence, it could be someone that could mentor you, could be someone that could speak wisdom into your life, could be someone that could help in some capacity. You avoid them because oh, I'm just going to feel so convicted. Or you get really defensive or whatever it is. You, you purposely avoid those things like Saul did. And you'd rather chuck a spear at it and run than actually engage it and work through what's actually hurting you. The fourth thing is, is you let personal desires control your mindset. You let personal desires control your mindset. And by personal, I mean selfish desires. Saul wanted to be known as the king. Saul wanted to be known and his identity was wrapped up in that. Saul wanted to be known for certain things. And the fact that anyone else was saying like what they were about David, it, it robbed him of his selfish desires and, and it robbed him of this image that he wanted to, per, to be portrayed. It robbed him of all of those things. And so Saul in his selfish and jealous way um, decided, you know what, I, I want to kill David. And he, and he intends to, there are several times after this that he, he tries to kill David. And what ends up happening in those moments is when our selfishness starts dictating everything, then we sacrifice our relationships. And so our selfish desires override the ability for us to have healthy friendships and marriages and relationships with our kids. Or, or maybe this, uh, you, you, for you it might be you choose to work all the time at the expense of the people around you. And you have this desire, and desire is good. Like, I'm not saying desire is a bad thing, but paying attention to what those desires actually are and where they're leading you. And is it leading you to healthier relationships or, or unhealthy relationships? And so, so we've got this aspect of, of what it looks like when to kill them, then what does it mean to cultivate healthy ones? And so here are a couple of things there. The first one is this, pay attention to who's in your inner circle. I've heard um, plenty of pastors, I don't know who started this, but plenty of pastors uh, I've heard say this, uh, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So, so who are the people that speak into your life? Who are the people that are your inner circle? Who are the people that you discuss life with? Who are those people? Are they people who challenge you and uh, are pushing you and are the kind of folks that are saying, hey, that's not right. Or here's the wise thing to do. Are, are they those kinds of people? Or do you look around and you think to yourself, man, my friends are messed up. Why is every couple I'm, I'm, I'm with that we hang out with, they're just, oh gosh, they're crazy. Or, or maybe it's like, man, have you seen the way they raise their kids? Why, why are all those kids so crazy? Like that's all year round. Guess what that means about you? You're crazy. Like you're not healthy. Like you're not the one okay, in those relationships. So now, does it mean that everyone's got to be like perfect in your circle? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. It's just, you got to pay attention to what is truly around you and who's speaking into you. And because and, like that's shaping. With Jonathan and David, this is what was so cool. With Jonathan and David, it talks about this bond that they have. And what they're doing, when it talks about the bond, it's this idea of their souls being tied together. That when you're around uh, good influences and your souls are tied together, then th what, what comes out? Good. So even in our weaknesses, even the things that we aren't good at, even the things that we struggle with, like no one's perfect, right? We all got our stuff. Like then you have people around you that are speaking into that to help bring you up. Like that's the, that's the healthy community part. And that's the bond that they have. The second thing that we see with Jonathan and uh, David is that they, uh, you got to ask what is best for everyone involved. Ask what is best for everyone involved. I, I love this picture because what Jonathan does, he's the heir to the throne. What's rightfully his is to be the next king. And what does he do? I'm going to give up uh, my tunic, my robe, which would have meant he would have been just standing there almost naked. I'm going to give up um, my, my bow, uh, my sword, and my belt. All of the things that represented power, all of the things that represented authority, all of the things that represented that he was going to be next king. He said this, I know it's better if you are, David. He's like, here you go. It's all yours. This is what Jesus was teaching when wa washing the feet. Are, are you willing to do what's best for other people? Are you willing to, uh, Ephesians 5, uh, this guy named Paul writes about submitting to one another. It's like, 
do you really want the best for the other person? We should be in this constant state of thinking to ourselves, how do I empower and elevate the people around me? What's best for them? And whatever it means, whatever it takes, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to, to sacrifice to make that happen because that's what's best. Can you imagine if every friend you've ever had did that? You were in a group of friends and that's all you guys did. You're like, what's best for you? What's, what's best for you? How do I elevate him? How do I elevate her? Can you imagine a grouping of people that would do that? Can you imagine uh, every marriage ever, like that's what you did? You just tried to outbest each other. The husband's like looking at his wife and he's like, what's going to be best for her? How, how do I do that? And the, and the wife's looking back, what's going to be best for him? How do I elevate and empower that? That's what Jonathan does for David. That's what David is doing in response for other people. That's what Jesus set the example for, for us to do, to have that kind of sacrificial mindset and to live in that. But here's the thing. Uh, we won't develop healthy relationships until we discover the joy in sacrifice. Until you see sacrifice as a joy, we'll always have an element of unhealthiness within us. Until we see it as like, I can't believe, like, I'm going to, I'm gonna, I get to sacrifice a little bit of like my money to make someone else's life better. Oh, that's so great. You, you mean to tell me I get to help out a friend? You mean to tell me just I get to give up some of my time to make sure that like that's going to be better for them? You mean to tell me like, oh my, I get to do that and you find the joy in that? That's when really healthy relationships come about. Jonathan and David uh, did that together. But here's the thing. We Here's what we do. We settle, don't we? When we don't want to empower and elevate and want what's best for people, we will settle. We will date crazy and unhealthy. Uh, we will uh, work too much. We will have uh, marriages that are, uh, they're, they're parallel. You live parallel lives that maybe intersect with kids, but then as soon as the kids are gone, they go back out to, to being parallel. We have relationships with our kids that are just authoritative, but they're not really like real relationships. And, and why, why does that happen? Because we don't find the joy in sacrifice. We don't find the joy in, in looking for what's best for everyone involved. Um, let me give you a personal example of where I did not do this well. Um, and so when we first had Max and Avea, uh, so they're 10 now, um, there's, a, there's an exactly nine-year difference between Max and Avea and Ruby. But when we had Max and Avea, we were in college ministry. And college ministry is like the best possible schedule in the history of schedules. And, um, and so it's like the best because like when students are off, like you're basically off and then you get breaks and it was, it was so good. So what ends up happening though is like we had the kids and Lacey stayed at home with the kids and we were in ministry part, like she was like part-time, but like we did everything together, but it was primary my deal. And, and so she stayed at home with the kids and, and I worried more about the ministry at that point in time. And so it, it worked a certain way. So then we have Ruby nine years later. And Lacey and I co-lead this church together. And so she's full-time here, just like I'm full-time here. And, and so here's what happens. Ruby comes along, and it's not the same. It's not the same. And, and so here's what I discovered about myself. Uh, it happened early on uh, after, when Lacey kind of got back into things. And, and Lacey said this to me one day. She goes, hey, can you go pick up the kids at school? I've got a couple meetings. And I already had a meeting on the, on the calendar too. And you know what the first thought in my head was? My meeting is more important. And it was this feeling of like, kind of like the classic patriarchal thing, right? Like what I'm doing as the guy in this scenario is just more important than what you're doing as the woman. And I had to verbalize that to her because here's what I did. I knew if I verbalized it, I knew how much, I would, I would feel how much of a jerk I was being. And so I've verbalized it, and I've actually had to say it a few times. And, and I've said, oh, can I just be honest with what I'm feeling? And I wonder how many of us are in that same space. We think what we do is, is more important, or we think what we do is somehow is like we want to elevate ourselves but not empower uh, someone else around us. And we act like that, and we talk like that, we think like that, and we might hide it at times, but you know how we really feel? And what does that do? It creates unhealthy dynamics in our relationships. And so, so we, have to be, we have to be vulnerable and transparent and talk about it and work on it. Why? And let God speak into it. 
and be willing to, to do this. And, and let me say this. When it talks about elevating and empowering and all those things, if we aren't willing to invest in our relationships in a healthy way, then do we actually really care about them? So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything. But think about it this way. Everyone in here is in a relationship in some capacity. How much have you done in the last year that you can tangibly say you have been very intentional about conversations, about your childhood and what happened in there and to grow, maybe it's with a counselor, maybe it's with friends, to learn what shaped you in your life. How much have you done that? How much have you listened to podcasts or read books about how your brains work or how you develop relationships or how love works or, or some, some of the intricacies of relationships? How many books have you read? How many podcasts have you listened to? How many intentional conversations have you had with a spouse or a grouping of friends um, that were centered around how to have healthier relationships? How many? If you can't think and kind of articulate several things out of that, then let me tell you, you don't really care about having healthy relationships. You might as well just turn to the person that you're with and say, I love you in theory, but I just don't want to do the work to make it happen. And I just want to say this to the men, because not that women are off the hook, um, but let me just say this to the men in here first. Stereotypically, we are the worst at this. We don't want to dig into what our past was like. We don't want to dig into what, uh, what we were raised with. We don't want to dig into what the effects of maybe a divorce or something that happened in your childhood. We don't want to dig into any of those things. And we think it means to be strong and we can compartmentalize. I can just get, I'll just get by it. It's not that big of a deal. It's not impacting my life now. It was so long ago. That's the language we use. And then we overwork. We become distant from our spouses or our friends or even if we have any other friends. And the end result is we pass this on to anyone else that we might raise. This is how generational sin happens, when we don't deal with it. And in the wake of everything is like this, this sea of like broken marriages and broken friendships. And so for you men in here, do something about it. If you sit here and listening to me like, I don't have time to read. I don't have time to listen to something. I don't have time. You do. You have to realize you just don't care enough at this point in your life to do something about it. You do. This should be a sea of men if we love Jesus. We should be a sea of men investing in what it means to have healthy relationships. Can you imagine if every wife or every girl that was in a grouping of friends that had men in it, can you imagine that if every girl and every woman on the face of this planet uh, experienced this, Hey, let me tell you what I've learned about my past. Let me tell you, I've been like really thinking about like how I was raised and how this has impacted me. You know what? I want to have healthy relationships now. So this is what I'm kind of, I'm turning now. This is what I'm learning. I've read this book. Can you imagine if like your husband came home and he's like, sweetie, you'll never guess what I read. Can you think about it if groupings of friends got together and just started challenging each other on what that meant? It would change everything. Everything. So do you really care? If you do, you can talk about it. If you do, it's tangible. If you do, you can explain it. The only other option then is to sit there and say, I just, in theory, yeah, I love the idea, but I just don't want to put the work in. Here's the last thing, and this is the most important thing to fix our eyes on God. We want to fix our eyes on God. You know, when you look at what Saul did, he, he was enamored with power. He was enamored with his title. He was enamored with um, the things that people said about him. And it distracted him. And what was a path for him to take with God, he got distracted from and, and, and moved off of. And 
And here's David and Jonathan were staying in step with God. They'd fixed their eyes on God, and, and that made them go in a certain direction. And so it's the same thing for us. Like I said earlier, when we love God more, we love people more. Now, why is that? Because we were designed that way. We were created that way. Are there practical things to having healthy relationships? Of course. Of course. But at the core of the very being of, of who we are, at the core of the message of Jesus, is this idea of, of making a broken relationship whole, healthy, restored, to looking in what had separated, looking what had changed, and saying, the message of Jesus is out. We're going to bring this together. And so then for us, as we fix our eyes on God, then that same mindset and heart begins to happen. So we're going to do something um, different today that, um, I don't know, maybe we'll do it forever, but we're going to do it for the next few weeks. In the same way that we do two minutes of talk, we're going to do two minutes to think. And we're going to put some questions up here on the screen, and um, these guys are going to play in the background, and they're going to sing one song together to end, and I'll come up and pray after that and dismiss us. But there's a, we believe there's always a transcendent thing that happens that God's trying to speak to us. And so what we want to do is just pause for a second and let you think about it rather than rushing into the next thing. So can we do that together for the next two minutes?